Builders of the Ancient Mysteries with Johanna James. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents, this is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science, where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. And uh, so we have a great show for you guys this week. We spoke to Johanna James of the Funny Old World YouTube channel. She's... uh, She's been diving into the ancient mysteries since she went to Egypt with Ben, and I guess a little bit before that. But she's been doing an interesting project with the BAM team, the Builders of the Ancient Mysteries uh, documentary team. And uh, so Kyle and I watched that documentary, and then uh, and then we had a good conversation with her about what's going on with that and where they're going in the future and what sh- and how she's involved in it. So... Look yeah, forward to that. some of the mysteries about it and interesting yeah. stuff around. <laughs> That's right. Lots of uh, mysteries and those know, ideas. Dis- it was great. Discussing stonework and all that kind of stuff that we love. Some scurps. Yeah. A couple of scurps. <laughs> and there is going to be video for that. So, you know, if you're if you're listening, uh, but you want to see some of the stuff we're talking about, Johanna does share some images. So you can go to their YouTube channel and check that out. The video should start in the second segment. Yes. But yes, we are videoless as often as possible. So That's the right. first segment needs no video, so we have none. That's right. <laughs> All right, let's tackle some space weather news. From spaceweather.com. If I can have it pulled up here. M flares from the northeastern limb of the sun. Sprawling sunspot complex AR3014-15 is crackling with M-class solar flares. The latest, an M2-class explosion on May 16th, caused a minor shortwave radio blackout over the mid-Atlantic Ocean. The region is growing in size and complexity as it turns towards Earth, which means stronger flares are possible in the days ahead. Also, the total eclipse of the moon last night. The full moon passed through the shadow of Earth, producing a total lunar eclipse. It was really dark, says Robbie Merrill, who photographed totality from Columbia in Missouri. The deep shade of red was amazing, he adds. Uh, and he got a three-second exposure, captured, which captured many faint stars around the shadowed moon. So, yeah, we, uh, we watched this with Brad and some friends up at the, uh, up at the top where we got a, a viewing deck. And uh, it was a lot. It was a lot of fun. It was just beautiful weather, too. It was yeah. like perfect it was temperature. A nice perfect. little slight breeze. Mm-hmm. We had some good chairs. Relatively just clear, back. Le- relatively clear skies. A little hazy. Uh, I've looked at a lot of people's pictures, and they're much redder than what we saw. So. They're just, they're just, you know, they're doing, they're they photoshopping. Doing all color correction. They're making it red. Yeah. No, it, it was, it was reddish. Yeah. Ish. Ish. But yeah, yeah the man, hazy. it was, it was really cool. Just seeing the uh, the moon rise was beautiful. The sunset was beautiful. Yep. We had God rays. During yeah. the sunset, and then uh, it was clear skies. So then, when the when you know the the shadows started passing over the moon, the stars started coming out, and then we started seeing shooting stars, and it was yep. just, it was great, just hanging out there. Yep, we had my old telescope set up, and I took a bunch of photographs through the telescope, so that was fun. Um, and then the telescope the telescope's motors broke. So that one's going into the trash. Into the trash. <laughs> Time to get a new telescope because it stopped being able to track in the horizontal plane and only in the vertical, which meant I had to make horizontal Manual adjustments, adjustments manually every freaking 30 seconds, which was a huge pain. Um, but yeah, it was cool. Like as as the as the totality increased and the moon got dimmer and dimmer, like stars started to appear obviously in the rest of the sky, but then around it, like really faint stars started showing up that you could see through the telescope right next to the moon that would... And looking at the moon through the binoculars when it was completely covered in shadow yeah, had this really awesome effect because it, I'm assuming just because the light wasn't so blinding. Yeah. It was dim and it really looked like a three-dimensional sphere hovering out there in yes. amongst, you know, like with yes. the stars as the background. It was it was really cool. Yeah, that was that was cool. 
So continuing on here with the article from Space Weather News, many observers remarked on the darkness of this totality. It was the darkest total lunar eclipse in recent memory, possibly as dark as the 1993 total, said Chris Cook from Massachusetts. Stars, which would normally be invisible, popped into view. Uh, this darkness is probably a sign of volcanic ash. Earlier this year, an undersea volcano erupted near Tonga, hurling 400 million kilograms of ash and fumes deep into the stratosphere. During a lunar eclipse, most of the light illuminating, illuminating the moon passes through Earth's stratosphere where it is reddened by scattering. Lingering exhaust from Tonga almost certainly made this eclipse darker and redder than usual. Hmm. Light levels were so low that Francisco Rodriguez was able to photograph the Milky Way during the eclipse from the Canary Islands. That's cool. Yeah. So, yes. The Man, view I wish was, I would have had a good camera. So I know, I yeah. It. View was spectacular, said Rodriguez, whose exposure also captured faint bands of green air glow. And air glow is a dim upper atmospheric phenomenon usually, usually reserved for nights when the moon is new. So, yes, this was a dark eclipse Indeed. indeed. Current conditions, solar wind speed 512.3 kilometers per second. The density is 9.76 protons per cubic centimeter. Current sunspot, sunspot number is 129. The neutron count is a low 5.6% above the space age average, still dropping. And the planetary K index is at 2, which is quiet. And the 24-hour max is 3, which is still quiet. So that is your space weather news for the week. Let's take a look at crypto. I think crypto is still down. Good. Last I checked. Yes, Bitcoin is at $29,971.65. Mm -hmm. And Ethereum is at $2,035.13. So that is your crypto update for the week. And what else we got? We got... Get back. Agricultural update. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, this is a time of year where we normally worry about hail and big storms, and we haven't had anything like that. And we've had almost no rain, which is yes. crazy. I think we've had 1.6 inches of rain since I set up the new uh, weather station. Yeah. Which was like right at the end of the winter. Right. Yeah, so, so. very little rain. Like last year, we had so much rain that we didn't have to irrigate very much at all. Yeah. This year, it's all irrigation. Yep. So we got nets up to protect the vines from hail that hasn't come, um, which is good. But and that's good for the peaches because I've done a lot of work on the peach trees this year. And if we had hail, we don't have any netting for those. So that would be, it would do a lot of damage to the trees. So I'm thankful for that, but rain would be nice. But the other thing we did agriculturally was we had to move the bees. Uh, so this is a fun and interesting project. How do you... When bee, you know, the bees have a specific way they navigate, and the foragers have to be able to go out and fly miles away, sometimes miles from the hive, and find their way back. So, how do you move a hive and not lose a lot of bees? So, there's a couple of methods, <clears throat> and we went with the uh, one of them is sequestration. You have to seal the hives up, so you have to do it at night. Uh, so, basically, you wait until after dark when all the foragers will be back in the hive, and then you basically seal up the entrances, so which traps the bees inside the hive. Uh, and then some people will actually leave them sealed for several days. That's sequestration, uh, which, you know, so that, that makes it, basically makes it where the bees, once you let them back out, they will reorient themselves uh, because they are, for whatever reason, they think something catastrophic has happened to the hive sealed up the entrance and then reopened it uh so i guess if that happens in nature it usually means there's been a landslide or something i don't know you know the hive has been moved or it's been sealed up and then uncovered <clears throat> but the other thing you can do to sort of simulate that situation is place a bunch of obstruction in front of the entrance of the hive so that's the one we we went with because there's a like you you can you can move hives in a if if it's a very short distance or a very long distance, you can move them without worrying about this. So in other words, if it's more than two miles, if you're moving the hive more than two miles from its from the place where it where it has been sitting for a long time, then there's not a problem. Because they will automatically reorient themselves. See, all the bees are sitting in the hive and they're thinking while they're in the truck, they're like, huh, 
We must have gone more than two miles by now. <laughs> right. So we better make sure we know where we are when we come out. <laughs> but if you only move them a few hundred yards, they don't realize that they've only moved a few hundred yards yet <laughs> because the two mile marker hasn't been hit in their brains. <laughs> yeah. And so they However, come out works. and they think that they know where they are. <laughs> but then they can't find the hive. Right. Or if you're only moving them a couple of feet. Uh, but I actually, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about that because I moved two hives earlier this year a couple of feet. Like literally both hives I moved maybe four feet max each. Uh, just I just all I did was shift them forward a bit uh, to put them on a different because they were sitting clo uh, pretty much on the ground. And then I set up some boulders and put the hives up on the boulders and the boulders were just a little bit in front of where the hives were. So I moved them maybe four feet. And when I went out there the next day, and I did it at night and everything, but I went, when I went out there the next day, there were a bunch of bees on the ground where the hives used to be. Like, it's right there. And yet there's all these bees on the ground where the hive was, four feet behind where the hive is now. Like, completely confused, as if, as if they couldn't see or smell the hive four feet away from them. So I don't know how they navigate or how they, you know, how can you get lost when the thing you're trying to find is right next to you and very visible. Yeah, I don't apparently know. Apparently their reasoning is not like ours. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> Whatever they're using to navigate, it can confuse and them. And recognize their own home. Yeah. You know, it's, but yeah. the, you know, the queen supposedly she has pheromones. Pheromones. And so they can recognize that. And yeah. And it, it seems like four feet would be within pheromone distance. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. So maybe there's just a lot of pheromones concentrated on the ground where the hive was maybe so yeah so they're just still smelling the hive there I, I have no idea but anyway it wasn't a big deal they eventually like after a, f a couple of days there were no longer any bees on the ground where the hives were yeah you know like they figured it out or all those bees died i don't know well we moved them um, many hundreds of yards away yeah we yeah. had to we had to get still a wide open <laughs> field yeah you know, there's the peach trees are out there the grapes are out there we moved them way down uh, to the south, but it's it's like you can see the place that we moved them from where they were, but it's far away. Yeah. Anyway, that was yeah. We were up. We I don't know what we were doing that until like midnight or yeah. almost one o'clock in the morning. One o'clock in the morning. Because so we yes. had to, we had to like we had to bring wooden slats and like screw all the sections of the hive together just so that we made sure they didn't topple or just get shifted or something when we were moving them. And then seal up the hive and then put it on the forks of the machine and slowly try to drive them over there smoothly. Well, we ratchet, ratchet strapped them down to the yep, forks. That's right. Then moved them. We had set out all these boulders previously during the day that we wanted to set them on. And then we, we set them out there. And then we went and cut brush and we laid all the brush up there. Yeah, so that's the obstruction in front of the entrance. Like you, you get left really sealed up. Yeah, you get really leafy. You know, brush, branches, whatever, trees, whatever, something, and then you sort of lay it thickly in front of the entrances of the hive so that when the bees come out, after you unseal the entrance, when they come out, they see all this obstruction that they have to basically crawl through to get out into the open, and that's supposed to make them reorient themselves. Right, plus this... this sequestration of 24 hours or whatever. Yeah. You know, well, I guess we did about... I don't know, 15 hours or yeah, something. Yeah, 15 hours sequestration. So those two things together, hopefully, we haven't gone back to sea because... And the next day I went out there and one of the hives had, like, forced their way through the, the blockage, yeah. which was duct tape. Yeah. <laughs> they got through it uh, somehow. They pushed it open. Yeah, that's and the one were, that I couldn't see. They were properly. mad. Yeah. yeah, they were flying all around and uh, very angry. And then the other hives, you could hear them just in there like... Wah! Yeah. They were mad. They were mad. And I ripped open the tape and they all came flying out and they were trying to figure out why I had done this to them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I don't know. We'll see what happens tomorrow. Yeah. So we haven't been able to go back to see the results of the experiment because we had the meetup this weekend. Uh -huh. And that was a lot of fun. So we didn't get to go kayaking. The, the river wasn't high enough. It would have apparently it would have been like 50% walking so yeah. just basically we hung out at the at the cabins that we rented and 
and uh, the river was a, a bit of a hike down down the hill uh, and across a bunch of river gravel to the swimming hole. But, you know, we would hike down there multiple times a day and just hang out, do some swimming. Then we'd come back up and do some grilling. We did a lot of jamming. Yep. Uh, and then, obviously, a bunch of uh, UFO and pyramid talks. Yes, it was pretty much all, you know, swimming, all snake swimming all and jamming, but nonstop pyramid and UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We actually performed episode 201 live for the first time. We did. <laughs> the the song. Yeah. The theme song. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Yeah. Which has never been done. I think that song has never been played since it was done for the show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh but yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Everybody And a bunch a of our and- you know, a bunch of our friends also showed up and so we had you know, we've all jammed with each other a bunch, so it was just, it was cool. Had a lot of instruments, banjo, you know, there might have been some rapping that <laughs> happened. So there was a lot of fun jam sessions and late night conversations. And um, Marty got us to take tequila shots. Yes. Which I hardly ever died. happens. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle almost died. I was so hungover when we were coming home. It was just like, man, this is this is rough. But then, you know, we watched the lunar eclipse and it was awesome. That was yeah. like I was just laying in a lounge chair on the deck, just like, ah, oh, what yeah. a great ending. Yes. It was a perfect ending to a really fun weekend. So we want to do more of these. Uh yeah, and I'm man. They'll be better organized. I really hope that the that the fewer people up will next die. Time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? I was just really, I'm really hoping that the river's up next time because yeah. it's, yeah, that would that would just have been a great addition. But no matter what, we have a good time, folks. That's right. That's right. And so thanks to all of you who showed up, uh, yeah. all of you listening who showed up. You guys know who you are. Thank you so much. It was a blast, and it was great to meet all of you. And uh, plan on doing more of these in the future. And I also encourage any... Enterprising, you know, Snake Force members, if you want to set up a meetup in your area, do it. Find a place, get a bunch of people to go. You know, if you tell us about it, we can help you. Uh, we can tell people, we can tell people in the Discord, we can tell people over the show, you know, big meetup in wherever you are. They're going to do it at this place, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, set up stuff to meet up with your fellow snakes. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. We can't be at all of them, obviously, but. You know, you can always go look at weird stuff with uh, with Snake Force members. That's right. All right. Anything else? Or we just want to let's dive into this. I think I think that's it. Yeah. Let's dive into this interview with Johanna James. This is Brothers of the Servant Podcast, and we are jo- joined by Johanna James. She has a YouTube channel called Funny Old World. Uh, she was with us on one of the swap casts we did with Ben from Uncharted X, and she was on Cosmographia, one of the live streams we did with Randall. Uh, but today, she's specifically joining us to talk about her work with the producers for the Builders of the Ancient Mysteries documentary. Welcome, Johanna. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me back, guys. Yeah. yeah. Glad to have you. That's right. So tell us about the process. Like, what? how did you get into this? And, you know, like, let's hear the story. Let's hear some of the inside baseball. Let's hear the story. So, um, well, uh, yeah, I've been doing the YouTube channel for about a year. I'm a complete armchair archaeologist. I just um, got into it mainly in the pandemic. I was just really interested in ancient civilizations. Found Ben's channel from Uncharted X. Of course. And I decided to join him on his tour in Egypt and got so much amazing footage and was just so overwhelmed, made a YouTube channel. And then now this is kind of what I do and uh, skip to the part where I joined the the creators of BAM. Uh, I, I got in contact with the producer um, to say that I loved the the movies because I'd watched the documentaries just as a fan. And I offered uh, my skills because I'm an actress. Um, and I was like, if you guys ever want someone to voice over your stuff, because they're a French film company and their previous documentary, the original one, had a kind of 
bit of an odd um, non-English speaking, um, non-native English speaking uh, voiceover yeah. artist. And so I was like, hey, if you ever want that in the future, maybe. And he, uh, Patrice just jumped on it and was like, actually, yes, we're desperately in need of like a proper English recording artist. The previous lady we used, um, we've had really bad fever con and we would love it. So their team were like, come to Paris. They flew me out and we had like two days to re-record the original movie. Um, wow. Literally. To, and the, the movie is like two and a half hours long. You literally just watched it. It's, a, right. it's yes. a big old meaty project. So, um, yeah, that was kind of mad. We didn't really sleep. <laughs> I didn't sleep. <laughs> so uh, we, wait, so wait, you you did the translation and the recording in two days? Is that? Um, well, we. Uh, I got the script before and I was scanning through and um, most of for the first hour, the, the translation was pretty okay. I think it was translated by different people in different sections. Mm. The first uh, hour seemed to be fine. The only thing that I said was there was lots of one, like one does this, one does that. And I was yes. like, nobody really, says that. like my grandma, maybe the queen, like nobody. <laughs> so I was like, can we change that to like, you can find this and you might find that. And so I was just making little minor changes. And then it was, as it was getting later into the second day, we had to finish. I had my flight booked the next morning. We had to finish it. And the translation was getting more and more fudgy. And I, it was gobbledygook. And I was yeah. like, I'm so sorry, guys. Like, this it actually isn't English. And I think what had happened is someone had literally said, oh, I'll translate this, put it into Google Translate. And then that's what kind of came out the other side. Yeah. Um, like, yeah. it was English words, but it didn't have any meaning. Um so we were all sat there. There was like three of us, like the recording guy and Patrice, the director and me. And we're try desperately trying to think of words. And then we, we lose all, you just lose any sense of the English language. You're like, I know what I kind of want to say, but I don't know what, um, so maybe we can just write it, interpret it. I don't know. Let's just dance it out or something. Um, but we got there in the end. I think it all makes sense now. And it's, um, it, we're, we're having really good feedback. It's out now. It's live and people seem to be loving it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we, we went to watch it and I guess we watched the old version and we were like, yes, this, she definitely needs to redo this uh, narration. <laughs> That's right. But, uh, yeah, so we're going to have to watch it again after the show. Looking forward to that though. Um, I mean, so yeah, that's really cool. They, I, I didn't realize they would fly you out there. Um, so how many hours do you think it was in the studio? Oh, so the first day it was like 11 till we, we were doing like 13 hours but then the the second day we got there earlier because we were like okay we, we realized how long it's actually taking to get through this and then we left at three in the morning and i had a oh flight at 8 8 no. and we were an hour drive the studio was an hour drive from the center of paris where i was staying so we were driving at like three in the morning utterly and then literally like two hours sleep up again for the airport and then oh, I, I had work the day in england so i arrived <laughs> at my work the next day like I felt like a rock star, an ancient <laughs> rock star. <laughs> Man, that's what a cool experience. Yeah. Uh, but it was, and I learned so much and Patrice told me, so the, the, these are, a, they're a French collective. Um, they're really passionate about ancient history and all the, the ancient mysteries. And um, they have made two, no, they've made three documentaries so far and no, they've made two documentaries so far and they're fundraising for the third one, which they want to specifically just focus on the Barbar Caves. So they touch on the Barbar Caves um, twice in the original documentary, a lot more in the Back to Bam, the second one. And then the third one, they want to just focus wholly on that. Um, and they were like, well, you're kind of part of the collective now. Do you want to come out to Barbar with us and be like on the ground? Awesome. Um, so that's kind of maybe the next plan if I get to go. Although uh, Patrice told me about the experience of going out and filming in India at these, this is a really remote site. So it's nothing like in Egypt, you get to go and it's kind of luxury hotels in the day or the night. And, and there's like loads of tourists. Barabar Bar is so remote and there's no tourists. Nobody really is bothered by it or knows where it is. So it's a real like jungle trek thing it's going to test you it's extreme it's an extreme journey to go there there's no hotels there's no restaurants um they i thought they were joking we have like a whatsapp group and they were like this is where you'll sleep and it was they it was a photo of like wooden crates <laughs> and i was like haha yeah guys ha. and then I found out, like no no they're serious that they, where they stay uh it's like a kind of wooden crate situation and they kind of fling you a blanket and that's it <laughs> 
<laughs> That's it. <laughs> Indiana James. <laughs> Indiana um, James. <laughs> that's my nickname. Um, and he said that it's like blazing hot in the day and freezing cold at night. So you get both the extremities and the mosquitoes are crazy. Um, and there's like, there's no, there's nothing to stop them. He, um, Patrice said he, he went to sleep at night and he was so cold. He put like a hoodie on and he, he pulled the hoodie right over his face. So like literally just his nose was poking out. And then he said in the morning, his entire nose had hundreds and hundreds of mosquito bites just oh, on the edge of his nose. And it was, they'd eaten him. And yeah, they said, so like food is, and sourcing food is an issue. Um, it's not clean. It's yeah. Um, there was th the blankets that they were given. Nobody wanted to use them because they were like not very sanitary. Um, <laughs> I was like, guys, you're really selling me this trip. Um <laughs> Maybe you go and I'll just do the voice like in the nice studio in Paris. Like, what about that? Um, but, but, but you, I'm so you gotta intrigued. go. You gotta go. I kind of have to, don't I? Like, yeah. and I have to vlog that. That would be epic. <laughs> like, guys, I haven't eaten a day. But um, <laughs> it, it, uh, it the, the, the caves are, I think, the smoking gun of like the ancient technology world um and also what's cool is in egypt it's so hard to get any kind of permission to to test anything or scan anything like they really it's it's so guarded and gatekept gatekept gate kept I'm not sure oh yeah i translate english <laughs> <laughs> um, but barbar like i said like it nobody goes there you can just kind of walk in there's no tourism um that's why you can go and spend a whole week studying it and bringing all this equipment in um the locals are lovely and and i think that they're like they're just allowed to do all the testing and getting all of the results that we would want to do in egypt yes Things like that yeah so that's exciting. i thought the same thing when we were watching it and you know they had the lidar scanner in there uh like the, like being able to do that you know in the serapium for example just like you couldn't how would you even get the permission in Egypt to do it? But they were just able to bring that scanner in there and get those really high definition. Oh, yeah. Scans. They bought all this equipment in there. They bought like um, proper um, LIDAR scanning, like yeah. um, similar to MRI, I think is like the, yeah. the level of, um, you can see like to the millimeter. And in the, in the documentary, they show all of the scan footage raw. Um, so they haven't altered it or put any kind of filter made. Like it's just, these are the images that we've got. Um, so you can see the detail and it is mind blowing. Yeah. They're just absolutely like, people are like, what are they talking about? We're, we're talking about Barabar caves. That's right. It sounds like something out of a kid's film, like the Barabar caves. <laughs> the genie in it. It does. <laughs> but, but yes, I, I, I remember looking at images of these things, th those caves years ago. And like, th that's the other part. I don't know why this bothers me, but they call them caves. And I'm like, they're not, they're not caves, you know, not even close. They're, they're, yeah. they're rock cut, uh, like interior spaces. Rooms. Yeah. yeah. They're rooms. They're, there's, there's no rooms. cave. Yeah. There's no caves about them. So it's weird. It's weird that the names get translated. They also have that with other, like the, what are they called? Uh, Elejanta. I can't remember the names, but there's other places they call caves in India that are huge rock cut constructions. Hmm. You know, but they just attach caves to it, which makes it sound more primitive when you think about it. It's like, I don't know. I don't know why that name is like that. Yeah. The ca yeah. Cave is not a cave. It's, it's a precision cut granite room and they're nicknamed the sound rooms because yeah. I think, I think they're all about sound. Like, uh, so far, a lot of the testing that's come back has told us that, uh, it's, it's all to do with tuned frequencies. Um, the, and, and each cave is tuned to different frequencies as well. Hmm. So it's almost like harmonical, like massive instrument rooms kind of thing. Hmm. Um, it, I, I, I've got little details on, on what, what cave uh, has what frequency. Um, but so, so there's, there's five caves in total, two unfinished and three finished. And the three finished ones, they have a specific resonating frequencies at 200 hertz and then multiples of 400 hertz 800 hertz a thousand and 1200 um the other cave has the similar results 200 400 800 up to 1200 and then the third one has just 200 and 1000 so they're just specifically resonating at those frequencies hmm. and the um patrice brought in a 
like a shaman um, to, to, to sing and do all different kind of amazing uh, sounds inside the cave and they recorded it and they would have it, apparently they were having like great fun testing it out. They were also playing, they, they put like a speaker in the middle and they were playing all different kinds of music in there to be like, what happens if you put rock in there or you uh -huh. know, R and B classic R and B what happened? Um, and he said it was just amazing. Like the, the sounds um, cause the, the, the caves are, they're not, um, they're precisely cut, but they're not squared off like in the Serapeum, which is all flat square angles. They're yeah. all curves, which creates a kind of weird resonance where uh, like the echo is reduced. So when you hear a sound, it's like, it's like the opposite to having an echoey cave. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it like increases the, uh, the richness of the sound that's, that's coming back at you. Um, yeah. The, which, the... which is, in, so it's, the parallel surfaces can create these really nice resonant standing waves, but because they're not parallel walls or because they're curves, it causes like a diffusion pattern, you know? Uh, um, mm. And so then I guess certain frequencies will stand out, but you won't have like the simple harmonic frequencies going on and on uh, above okay. that. That's right. Yeah. I, I, yeah we, we, like you said, we just watched the documentary and they were talking about how the <laughs> the exterior walls are tilted inwards or outwards. I think it's inwards, right? Are they tilted? Yeah, in? Yes. yeah. slightly. Uh, I did. I also loved the the idea that you know the, that these vaulted ceilings um, are actually sections of a you know of, of a, a circle of a, of a tube like a or a sphere. Yeah, of a cylinder or a sphere. And they were like, well, this isn't really necessary, but for whatever reason, they were doing it this way. And most of them, the uh, the center of the the sphere or the the cylinder was above the floor, but there's one where it's below it, which would make mm -hmm. it very difficult to do the measurement across the. Yeah, that, that's it. Like, there's a lot of head scratching kind of yeah. elements to the to the to the to the rooms, but uh, yeah, exactly that one where it, there's like the end of the the cave is in like a kind of, it's a cylinder sort of bit at the end, and to get the axis, like the center axis of that. Um, diameter and that like curve, you have to set it below the floor. So I was like, how do you even start? How do you measure, yeah, do you measure below it? the floor <laughs> to get to make sure that is like so precise? And yeah. there isn't there there isn't a mistake. There isn't room for a single mistake in the three finished caves, which brings up a, a whole other load of things. Like, well, okay, so where are the practice ones, or where are the the prototypes? Or it, it, it's just these five caves at the minute. Yeah. And like, are there more just sitting around that we haven't yet like found? Are they underwater? Are they at the top of the mountains? Because yeah. from outside, you wouldn't really know they were there. There were these tiny little doors, just the little, and then the, the actual rooms are huge inside. It's yeah. a bit of like a reverse TARDIS situation. Um, <laughs> um, you go and like, oh, it's massive on the inside. It doesn't look like that. But um <laughs> Yeah, it was, and what's also really cool um, from what I've heard from Patrice is he said that camera. It's really frustrating because cameras do not capture how shiny these surfaces are. So they look pretty shiny in in the footage that we can see. But he was like, when you see it with your eyes, you can see what you're seeing behind. It's like almost um, translucent. The crystal has been so polished that it's become see-through. Like the first few millimeters are just completely see-through. And so what you're seeing when you when you try to take a picture of it is you're actually seeing through to the granite behind that's un unpolished. Wow. And so the wall, the wall when, you, when they were like filming it, looked a lot more rough or had like rough, bumps. Yeah. And, wow. Yeah, he goes, but you have to see it with your eyes because you can see this layer of translucent kind of crystal. Um, that is unbelievably glass smooth. Like glass is, has a flatness of like 0 0.002. And I think the flattest surface they measured in there was 0 0.0011. So it was literally like 10 mm's of a, a micro measurement, the difference between glass and that and that wall. He was like, y y we can't, photos just don't do it justice. You got to come and yeah, see it with yeah. your eyes. So man, I'd love I was to like, see yeah, it. okay. I love to feel it. Just yeah, yeah. rub your body on it. <laughs> you know, just be one with the cave. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and so there's a couple that they that they call unfinished, uh, but in the documentary, they're sort of implying that maybe these are copies. Is that sort of what they're saying? So 
So this is where you've got two options. So the un, there's two unfinished, which are either they were the original ones and somebody messed up and did a mistake and therefore they had to like ax that version. And maybe these are the prototypes that we're looking for. Or they were left unfinished for some reason that we, you know, tools down scenario, like in many, many places. Yeah. And the um, a lot later, the kind of, next civilization tried to finish them off and uh basically couldn't because the only one of the caves that has any decoration to the outside of the cave is the unfinished one one of the unfinished ones and when you look at the um it's got a kind of it's like a kind of decorated gate over the what would be the entrance way and it's very much the indian style it's ornate it's got kind of carving and it's 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 good it looks pretty but when they scanned it and analyzed it it's no way precise it's kind of on the wonk um when they put like the leveling meters up against the the granite it was no way flat it was kind of curved so what they think is that the the civilization around sort of 2500 bc probably found it thought oh let's finish this one off and like make it look great they started to do the outside make the front the front gate look banging and then when they tried (laughs) to they tried to replicate this like flatness of the granite um they couldn't do it because you can see inside there's like they're on the ceiling they've chiseled way too deep and it means that it makes it impossible to polish because you would be polishing for a million years because they've there's like holes where the so i think they kind of went okay maybe we maybe we can't actually uh replicate this house so i'm i'm of a mind i'm open to both ideas but i'm of a mind that it's the second one simply because it makes sense it makes sense that they would start doing something to the outside none of the other caves have anything to do with the outside they were not bothered in any way about what the outside looked like it looks like someone tried to come in and do like a, a diy job um and it just didn't they just couldn't yeah. it is really, really interesting though it. just the the way the outside entryway is set up it's like they they sort of cut in a large rectangle and make a create a flat surface out of the sloping exterior of the rock. Then they cut mm-hmm. the doorway smaller, a smaller rectangle. The doorway is cut through that. And it looks like the same thing in that cave in Peru where there's, you know, it's the same deal. They flatten the surface of the slope. Oh, yeah, wall, the gate of the gods. And then they shove yeah. a little smaller rectangle in there. That it's, I don't know, it's so... Yeah. It's just I find that those patterns um really interesting. Yeah, and that that and the gate yeah. of the gods there in Peru too also has the, you know, the Gobekli Tepe T shape. That doorway mm-hmm. is a little strange. And what's weird is that different caves have different placement of the doors. Like um some doors are on the side, some doors are on the end. Um it, it there's no like I don't, know. I don't know if it mattered where the door was. Um, yeah, that, you know, when we were just watching that and, you know, looking at the LIDAR scans, because they put the whole LIDAR scan up there and sort of spin it slowly so you could sort of see the whole configuration. And I just was wondering, you you cut the doorway in and then where you put the, the series of rooms on the inside is based on some kind of deep scan you did of the rock. Like there's a big fracture over there. So you want it over here. You want the room mm. shifted this way but you're putting the doorway in this particular spot on the outside. So that was one of the ideas I think you brought up is the un, one of the one unfinished, of the unfinished ones, ones looks yeah. like it has a giant fracture in the ceiling. Now, oh, right, that yeah, may be yeah. an artifact. That just may be what it looks like on camera. I guess it could be an inclusion of some yeah. different material, but it looks like a huge crack. Yeah, it looks like a big. there's a big fracture that goes all the way across, and it's like it was unfinished because they're like, yeah, this is going to make it where the room isn't going to be what we want it to be. So they just never finished yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe don't know. they did hit the. Maybe they hit a crack. Yeah, yeah. we're like, oh damn it, that's nine years of our life wasted, guys. That's Sorry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Start again. Let's just move over a couple of feet. Yeah, that's right. I also like uh, the idea that they were, you know, uh, like time capsule chambers or yes, something. Yes, they look like. Mm. To me, yeah. So I, I understand the stuff with the sound. Kyle and I've gone back and forth and back and forth on this on the sound stuff because it's like you know you find you can find this in modern day things too. We've we've discussed. We had a thing we did when we were like teenagers where we climbed down into a dry um, what was it a water tank? It was a big water big tank, concrete yeah. water tank, perfectly round. You know, yeah. and we climbed down in there. <clears throat> it was empty. It was dry, and it had amazing resonance. 
We you know? stayed yeah, in there was, for hours singing. Just, it was yeah, just so make, awesome. It was an absolutely amazing, like life-changing, mind-blowing <laughs> residence. But it's a water tank. It's not designed to be a spiritual chamber or whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know? Well... Uh, I mean, maybe. Start a cult. Start a cult. Okay, <laughs> the water tank cult. I mean, I get it. I when I visited the Giza, um, the the Great Pyramid, I I can't really sing. I'm not a singer. I was singing my head off inside the Giza. I was like, I can sing. This is I sound I sound amazing. Listen to this. And I was just, I was like, not shy. I was like, oh my God, the resonance. It's beautiful. And then I got outside the pyramid. I was like, nope, back to null. <laughs> but, Still can't sing. <laughs> okay. Well, something that uh, Patrice told me that wasn't in the, um, in the, the documentary was in the Sedona cave, which is, I think the one that has the very particular, like it's like an extra dome shaped room at the very yeah. end. Yes. Um, when they were doing all their like sound experiments, they said that if you stand in the very middle of that dome, um, the frequencies, different frequencies can make different body parts vibrate. And he that said, it's the weirdest thing. Yeah. So you're standing there and he was like, different parts of the body will vibrate at different frequencies where only when you're standing in the center of the dome at the end of the room. Now, wouldn't it be and cool if like, it was like okay. a, if it was actually a, like a healing chamber, it was a device designed, like maybe they had some kind of machinery in there to produce sound or they had a group of mm -hmm. trained people and you take the sick person and put them in the middle of that chamber. And then the trained people like sing certain things depending on their, whatever's wrong with their yes. body. And it like. I mean that that would be awesome, but I just don't know. I mean, like it's, it's it has a. I, I think so. I mean, it, it could be. It's on the table for our list of things to sort of ponder over because yeah, the, the different body parts and like the chakras are supposed to be in the seven different body parts of your body. And and I remember when I went down to the Therapeum, the manager guy who like looks after it there, he says that he likes to get in the boxes and when he sort of hums and sings at a certain frequency, he said he can like feel and clear all his chakras and stuff. Yeah. And so he uses the, the boxes for that reason. I, I mean, it wouldn't be out of the, if, if sound in the future, we really understand what this is for and what sound can do. I mean, they're already starting to use sound frequency to like help cancer and things. Yeah. Nikola it Tesla, wouldn't be out of. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say Nikola Tesla built this, this vibrating platform that he could tune to certain frequencies. And, um, he basically wrote about how he figured out he had this one frequency where if you stand on it long enough, it would like, I mean, it basically make you have to go poop. Right. But he was <laughs> oh, like, wow, it's, great. it's like you stand on it for like 15 minutes a day and like everybody <gasps> in his lab, need. <laughs> everybody in his lab would do it. And it's like, they all, it was like, it cleaned them out. And then they all had like more wow. energy and it was just awesome. Their whole, Lab crew was like way oh more healthy after this. Mark Twain wrote about it too. He went and tried it. <laughs> so maybe it's the la the laxative companies are the yeah. ones actually gatekeeping this because they don't want us to realize what we can do. That's right. I, I here's my I, point. Here's my point about the Barbar bar caves, though. Uh, you don't need to cut this structure out of granite to get that resonance. You could build it out of much yeah. easier to to build or use materials and still get that resonance as long as you have the geometry and a hard surface for the sound to ref uh, reflect off of. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing with the pyramid, like with the king's chamber. Do you need 2.3 million blocks or however many it is around the granite chamber? I don't think so. I think all you would need is the granite chamber. Yeah, why the faff, you know? Yeah. It's, why the it's, giant it's, triangles? It's why you know, the triangles? Why did they cut and it out of granite? Uh, you know, and granite. It's the, these places are remote. Uh, Patrice said that these that like the amount of stairs, like how high up you have to go to get like it is really is like it's it, it, yeah. He said that you're 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 out by the time you've got up the stairs, even just to the cave. Oh wow! Um, so it's it, they're so far and they're so far to travel to from anywhere. Um, it is like why there and why granite and especially because granite is so tough to work with. Yeah. Um, they're not supposed to have had tools that really could cut granite and polish granite like that. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the stone, um, masons that they took with them on the, on that trip was saying, what about the dust? He was oh, like, yeah. I work with, I work with stone outside and we have masks. I and mean, if we breathe it in, the dust is incredible granite. When you chip away at it, um, 
like really light sand shards come off of it. It's so dusty. And these, these caves are so huge and the entrance is so tiny. So they've got two things. One, what, how did they see what they were doing? Right. Like really well, because there's no evidence of like torch damage. Um, so what were they using to light the room? Because you really have to see if you're if you're polishing something to like near glass perfection, you got to be like, what kind of light would you have? And and well, that someone said, well, maybe they had mirrors in there to like, you know, shine yes. it all around. Yes, of course, the but mirrors then, theory. Yes, the, the classic mirrors theory. <laughs> Through all then the you dust. You can only work in the day. Yeah. <laughs> Through all the dust. Um, that's right. And and the, yeah, like the dust where he would just be like, how did they ventilate it? And how did you get that? It was just it's all like there's a lot of problems. Um, construction wise like hmm I, I think that about the pyramid as well like the, the big like i was crawling down like the 90 foot shafts and i was like imagine being the guy at the front of that just like hacking like yeah, you couldn't breathe exactly. like where do you put the dust that you've just hacked below yourself like it's i don't even know it's it's baffling and yeah I mean, and you can hardly fit one man in that shaft yeah and then at the, at the subterranean chamber there's that tunnel that's basically a, oh. a crawl way that goes back another, yeah. how, how far I was don't that? Know. I mean, freaking at least Forever. 50 feet, 50 feet. Yeah. More than that. You crawl all know. the way to the back of it. And you're just imagining like who hacked this away to go nowhere for nothing. nine miles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, I, I, um, I had to do that, uh, alone. Cause I remember everybody, when I went to the pyramid, everybody went up to the King's chamber oh, and yeah. I was like, I'm going to go. I'm going to go down, yes. but I was alone. <laughs> so I went down that alone. I'm quite claustrophobic as well. So uh, I remember that that long flat stretch going to the subterranean. It was like fear factor. I was like, right, you got to do this. And I just was talking to myself through it. And and there's there's no light in that tunnel either as well. That's like right. they, 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 yeah, they light the ones up. So it's just me with my phone kind of vlogging like, guys, this is the end. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it, but I was so proud of myself. And then you come through to the subterranean table and you're like, wow, it's just a rock room. <laughs> but um, and also a seemingly unfinished. Like, yeah. it's really weird. Yeah. It's a I was strange like, oh. room. Yeah. Okay. Very weird. Yeah. You'd think they'd, you know, shape it up a little bit, considering yeah. upstairs is so amazing. It's like the drop of the basement of the, of the, but whatever. Yeah. I was just proud that I survived. But that's, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go back this year. And I had an idea. And I was like, okay, if I could execute this idea, it'd be amazing. I just, for science, I don't want to do a little science experiment. I'd love to bring with me some sort of replica human body or like a Pharaoh's body, maybe even like a blow up Pharaoh doll. <laughs> and I'd love to try and see just logistically, how could I get it through the pyramid? You know, how um, dignified get it, would get that be? Get it to be? the king's chamber. <laughs> exactly. Like how can, I'm going to do my own Pharaoh's procession and just see, um, you know, is it feasible? Because I really struggled just to get myself just one small lady person through. Um, and I, I'd love to see what it would be like just dragging this <laughs> this thing through. So, you drag a mannequin <laughs> through the pyramid. Yeah, I'm going to try it. I mean, I might get kicked out of Egypt, but um, but that's like top of my video. <laughs> yeah, you, could, you could definitely use, yeah, if it was if it was blow up, you could have it packed away in your backpack until you got into the, yeah. You know, you get all the way to the descending top of the descending passageway and then <laughs> blow it up. Exactly. That's my plan. Start dragging it down. <laughs> In the name of science, yes. I will get this through. And then maybe I'll just leave it there and they'll be like, what well, is this alien? <laughs> yeah, just leave it in the in the coffer. In just the... leave it in there. But um but yeah, because I was just thinking that through and they're like, no, this is how they would, this is where the procession for the pharaoh. And I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah. That's not how I, I want to go, being right. dragged through a 90 foot tube. <laughs> but, but yeah. So are, uh, the so original. Oh, are, are you going to go to India? Are you going to go to these caves? Oh, I, mean, I, don't, I mean, the invitation's there. It's whether or not I have the balls to. Um, to actually hack it like i'd love to be part of history because i really think that the next movie the guys that like the information that they're going to go because they're going to go back again and that if they're going to do it um they're already up against so many people opposing them that they need to make sure that everything's done to the book like the right. um uh, yes the investigation needs to be kind of watertight um patrice went to one of the best like sound engineer companies in france and got a quote from them like how much would it cost to, for this kind Do of full um, analysis 
Yeah. And they said it would be about 10,000 euros for like to do an analyze it. Um, and they were like, great. Okay. We're going to, we're going to crowdfund. We're going to raise that money and we're going to get that, you know, and then the company, when they found out what it was for and it was for builders of the ancient mysteries, um, the company pulled out and we're like, we don't want to be associated with this. And which is, so they're going to have to go independently and find independent people who are willing to kind of Robert their company. Oh yeah. Walter might do it. Yeah, Chris Dunn has can, Chris Dunn has some sound engineer guys that maybe could work with. Okay, maybe you could hook them up. We're gonna we can arrange. Yeah, because I mean, they they had Chris in their in their documentary, so maybe they could already talk to him and see find out. Because we had Chris on the show, and he had a couple of guys on with him that one of them. Okay, was amazing. Yeah, yeah, because we just need people that are you know open minded. Because I don't think people should be like companies shouldn't be scared of these. Um, investigations because it's a win-win scenario really because if you if the information comes back and it doesn't prove anything then you're fine you've proved them wrong and if it comes back and it proves like history is different then you're part of that forward thinking yeah history movement so you kind of win either way um i feel but um they obviously don't want to be associated so fine. yeah because where you lose is you know you suddenly have all these academics trashing your company claiming that they're not scientific and you know <laughs> even if it's good information they'll do that yeah i know so that was a shame but but um they're gonna get it done and they're gonna do it really like proper um and yeah, so awesome. i think it I, I would love to be you know have my name you on gotta the team. go you gotta go also I'm, we're it's, gonna all give that, you, it's all guys we're gonna I'd give like, you like endless, some girls. we're gonna give you endless buckets of shit if you don't go Listen, there's this great product. There's a great product called Off. Yeah. Just buy some Off. And, you know, there's like little tiny awesome sleeping bags and tents. So you don't need their blankets. Uh, yeah. And you can, I think you can I'd destroy have to, their mosquitoes. I would come pre- I, would, I, I think I'd just sew myself a mosquito net. Like, <laughs> yes. Enclose yourself shoot. in a mosquito net. net. <laughs> That's right. And I just wear that the whole time. I'd live off like protein bars and we just do it. Apparently they say at the end of the week, so they spend like a week at Bar Bar doing all the investigations and slumming it out. And then at the end they go to Mumbai and they stay in like a five-star hotel and they get massages Pampered. and they're yeah. like, they kind of, they're like, serve this. And I was like, that sounds lovely. <laughs> that part. So, yeah, that part. So, um, yeah. Okay. All right. Oh man. Now peer pressure. I'm gonna. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do let's, it for science. Let's take a break. <laughs> and we'll be right back. Back, ladies and gentlemen, brothers of the Serpent Podcast, joined by Johanna James, and uh, still I'm talking here about. Still. Yep, yep. Still talking about the um, builders of the ancient mysteries documentary, um, and there's a lot more to touch on on that. Uh, but where do you want to go first here, Johanna? Oh, where do you want to go? Um, Let's talk about Patrice okay, and his, his story. Oh, yeah. Let's talk yeah. about Patrice. So yeah. Patrice is the, the lovely man who's behind the uh, builders of the ancient mysteries. And um, yeah, like I said, I reached out to him. He was like, come join us out there. And then when I got to know him over the few days, um, he just sort of found out his history. And he said that he was a filmmaker and he was quite successful. And he was doing some big like commercials, working with big brands like McDonald's and things. And he had an experience that changed his life. Um, he went and did ayahuasca and said that it, he it just changed his whole trajectory. And he said that he met um, like the consciousness of it, like the world. And he said that there's like, there's like one for the world. There's one for like the universe. There's like things are more sentient than we realize and everything's all connected and it sounds super duper hippie, but he's like, that's what I saw. And he said the same thing I've heard so many friends say and heard so many people say that it was female, whatever, like kind of consciousness, it will kind of felt feminine to him. Um, and he was like, right, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? I'm advertising McDonald's. No, I'm going to go and what's my passion. And so he started to do, um, and he directed the, the 
the pyramids. Yeah, revelation the of the pyramids. That's the one. Yes. Revelation of the pyramids, um, which wasn't like his movie, but um, he was part of that. And then got the momentum to then to then make Bam, um, and Bam, he's like so passionate about it, and he he's kind of he just wants to do it to try and educate and desperately reach like the next generation of people who might might be more open minded to this stuff um, and be willing to you know, try some stuff out, test it. Why not? Let's throw stuff at the wall, see what sticks, what doesn't. Um, let's not just assume everything from the generation before. So yeah. That was cool. And was I think, awesome. I, I, I really think, yeah, Revelation of the Pyramids was fantastic. Or is, it, is it Revelation of the Pyramid? Or I, don't know, I, uh, I always get the, the plurals wrong there. Uh, but yeah, that was, that's a great one. I recommend that to a lot of people. Uh, but watching Builders of the Ancient Mysteries, I agree. It looks like he's he's kind of taken the idea from that and just like let's really dive into some of these topics that were covered before, but in more depth. I love how yeah. the documentary shows the similarities and the building styles across all these different sites. You know, Kyle and I have talked about this many times on the podcast that like you see Revelation this. of the Pyramids. Okay, Revelation of the Pyramids. Yeah. Uh, but there's probably so many different movies there. There's says, Revelation of the yeah. Pyramid. And yeah. there's Revelations <laughs> of the Pyramids. Yeah. yeah. It says it's a conspiracy theory, theory pseudo scientific documentary. Oh, God. Of course, uh, well, it, of got, course it, it does. It got so many views. It got millions of views because I remember watching that one as well. Yeah. Um, so, and it got so many fantastic, like, it, like viral. It went viral, basically. Yeah. Um, but it got so much hate and so much stick. And, yeah. um, yeah, it was a bit of a learning curve, I think Patrice said, because there is some, there are some things in there that I've seen it, and that it it was great food for thought. I'm not entirely sure that the Great Pyramid was built. I don't think it was geopolymer. I mean, maybe yeah, geopolymer yeah. was in some sections of it because that would account for a lot of the time um, discrepancy and and whatnot. But yeah. I've physically seen the I've seen the limestone quarry of where loads of the bro blocks were like still being like stuck in the ground. And so Yeah. Yeah. And you can so. see the fossils and the sedimentary layers in the blocks themselves. So yeah. they're Yeah. They're clearly... So that's where I'm not so sure on that, but um on on that particular theory. But it was amazing to watch it. They they do great graphics in mm -hmm. these movies and you can really visualize and especially like, yeah, how did they like how do how? So yeah, yeah, it's food, it's food for films. That's right, and that's what I was. That is what I was saying. Is like one of the things they do really good in in Revelation and also Builders of the Ancient Mysteries is show you how these like heterogeneous walls that they build in a lot of these places they're not random. You know, like on this side there's this pattern, and on this side there's the mirror image of that pattern. You know, in so many mm. places like in Egypt and at Cusco or you know uh, Sacsayhuaman. Uh, Oyante Tambo, uh, Machu Picchu, you know, and and then of course showing you the similarities and styles to some of the stuff you see on Easter Island with the same wall building. Um, I mean, just that that's that's fascinating, and the implication that we're looking at a global uh, culture or the influence of a global culture possibly hmm. in these walls. I don't know. And then you know, they of course with this one they end with the uh, you know the younger Dryas. They bring in the younger Dryas at the end and they're talking about like, are we actually talking about something that was that existed during the Ice Age or even older? Uh, yeah, I like, love that. I really do. It's by the end. It's such a long documentary. By the end, you are like, I need to take a walk. My brain. It's yeah. what you, you start going. What is the world? Um, it's, <laughs> it's a lot. Um, but but what the good thing about the documentary is that it really makes you. It kind of also makes the world smaller because you're like, oh my god, it is all connected. When you're seeing it like this, and you're seeing all, every single site in the world has some sort of link with the with another one, whether it's in the stonework or whether it's in the traditions or the oral stories, and and um, yeah, you do go, damn, it's all connected, isn't it? Yes. Oh, the, the meter, the matrix. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the meter, the meter. Just taking a pill. Yeah, I did not <laughs> know. Meter. I did not know that the. Uh, H blocks at Pumapunku. At Pumapunku were a meter tall. I had not yes, realized like, that before. Yeah, exactly a meter tall. And the the meter is also in um, the the Great Pyramid. It's also at Baraba. Yeah. Um, yeah. The um, they were showing. Um, it's all. It gets heavily into like pi, and I can't do maths and stuff. But the, <laughs> you know, I'm going to trust the calculations. And the fact is, is that like 
a lot of the measurements of Baraba are in meters as well. Like some of the thing they're like, this is two meters with a three meter diameter or it's no, a six meter diameter in those like circular mm-hmm. rooms. Yes, right. And, and they're like, that's madness. These, these things are supposed to have been built thousands, possibly even more thousands of years before that. And the meter wasn't, did not exist apparently until 1795. Um, that's what one of my last the, the YouTube videos was about. I, I I kind of cut the segment about the meter from the show and put it on my YouTube just to say, do you understand that we are being taught that the meter didn't exist till 1795 and the only way we got the meter was because we measured the earth, but these ancient civilizations were all using the meter. So, so how, like, yeah. how did they, well, they either knew the measurement of the earth and they could work out what a meter was from that. They were told it by somebody else. So if they couldn't do it, somebody else before them could, or it, all a massive coincidence and everybody just accidentally stumbled across the meter and used it in all these sites. Yeah. That's mm. what was great again mm. about in the documentary, they show you like, you know, okay, first you have to know the polar circumference of the earth and then you divide that by 40 million. And then they're like, well, why yeah. did they specifically choose 40 million? And there is a mathematical reason. I can't remember. Do you remember the details? Yeah. Like it was something about, <clears throat> it was something about how you, uh, if it's 40 million, you can arrive at, these other numbers like yes high like if you do it by 40 million then then it shows other numbers in different ways uh, mm. and so in other words the it's it is possible that you know our arrival at the meter is something that has happened before but it's not coincidence because it is about the math in other words that somebody had done those same calculations ten thousand years ago and had arrived at they probably didn't call it the meter you know, but in other words, because you choose the division of 40 million, you end up with all these mathematical harmonies. Yes. And that's mm-hmm. what you want when you're doing that kind of geometry, you know, the, the <clears throat> earth measurements. And like the golden ratio and everything appearing in nature, I think it, it is all linked. And I think that's what made me sort of think about this, uh, that it is all linked, everything, the the planet and yes. all the sites and and even down to the mass of how these things are built and shaped and designed. Um, it's all complementing each other. And I think in the pyramid documentary, they talk about the meter and they talk about how one drop of water, if you just drop one drop of water, it'll make one centimeter. Um, but then I was like, but what if it's a really big drop or a small drop? <laughs> Like, how do you know what's one drop of water? Yeah, My drop could be very different. Does it have drop. to be, yeah, does it have to be pure water? What if it's salt water? I mean, yeah. <clears throat> what kind of water so are we talking about here? What temperature is the water when you drop it? Yes. Make, yeah. yeah. Exactly. But um, an interesting theory that that, that uh, one centimeter came from nature, from a drop of water, and that's how they could work out and times it by 100, making, yeah, but weird. <laughs> yeah, weird. but, but it, yes, it does seem like, you know, we're, we're asking about, well, how did we arrive at these standards of measure? But at the same time, when you kind of look into how we got to them, it seems to they seem to emerge from more fundamental properties of the universe, like you were talking about with fee and how we see that reflected in nature in all different ways. Uh, mm. So so it's like. But. Oh, sorry. Go on. No, no, go ahead. I, let's hear the. Uh, fight. Well, I was just going to I was going to segue because one thing about nature. So we're saying that all the measurements are coming from nature. However, when you look at specifically like the, the blueprint and the, 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 the recordings of the Barba Caves, this looks nothing like we ever see in nature. Oh, yeah. Like they are so futuristic and and kind of mechanically shaped. The yes. minute I saw them, I went this cave is from the year 3090 in the future. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's in um, the future. It, it, it doesn't look like anything um, that you ever see in India. I, I'm just, I mean, I've never actually been to India, but what I can see online and looking at all like the ancient Indian um, stone work, it's ornate. And it's like, it, it's like Egypt decoration times a billion. It's so amazingly yeah. uh, de- decorative and yet the barbell caves are the complete opposite it is the barest i'm gonna little let me share screen yeah and um and let's see if we can go for here okay and we're gonna go for the bar bar okay how we go um so what what have we got here? okay <clears throat> okay let's just try to describe this for the people listening at yes home. 
So this is the side of one of the caves and you can see that like slanted rock face that you were sort of talking about earlier. You've got the entryway. Oh, so this is the cave that has the entryway in the end of the tube. Right. That's what we're going to describe yeah. it. And um, you can see this, I mean, this is probably one of the most, more of the simpler designs, but um, a box with this um, slanted curved ceiling. There was a bit of a discrepancy in the translation because um, they kept talking about vaults and I was like what is a vault and they were like oh that's it that's means ceiling in French like it's the the vault the ceiling I was like oh yeah okay so in the in the new one you mean like curved ceiling and they're like yeah the vault (laughs) um but um so yeah the the ceiling it does it looks kind of like a tube of like a I don't know what like a not even a shoebox curved shoebox I can't even I'm not very good at describing in this game this this game's not good is it but um let's <laughs> look at the one of the more weird okay let's look at the, like the crazy weird one like look at this one yeah this is part of a machine if you showed me this and just went like guess what this is game I'd be like um it's a cog in a car or something <laughs> not the the cars have cogs I don't know but um <laughs> <laughs> it's I like, it looks saying, like though, a yeah. keyhole almost yeah it does look like a, yes yeah it's like what is this um it looks like a, i don't know it's like a record player and then we've got um but this is the the the, the plant like i've never seen anything shaped like this no. in nature and i've never seen it in any like ancient building it's they're using circles it's quite beautiful squ- yeah i love squares. this design um yeah. And, and so what comes to mind to me, thinking of um, resonance, is what I would like to see what it what the patterns look like in terms of focusing or diffusing sound in these chambers. So if the if the source of the sound was in the circular chamber, what does it look like coming out of the doorway into the larger chamber or vice versa? Mm-hmm. You know, like you were saying, it creates a resonance in the center of the round chamber if you make sound in this other one. I would love to see it, like the patterns of reflection and how they how they yeah. interact could, with these with this geometry. I just, I don't know. It would be awesome. I mean, I think you'd have to have some psychedelics or something to be able to see that happening. Oh, I mean, like, yes. <laughs> I mean, in terms but, of like somebody drawing diagrams. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you meant sitting in the cave. I was like, well, I will try for science. I will take that and I will evaluate it. Um, but yeah, this one's the one we're looking at right now is that is the cave and it's the only one that's got like a, it's almost, it has like a second entryway into mm. another room, which is a pure circle. And I think this is the one which is the six meters um, and the one that has the incredible axis that goes below the floor. So however, they, they made like a literal massive dome and half of it should go into the floor. If it was going to be a complete globe, it would be under the floor by like yeah. half a meter so the or something. Room is, the room is circular, but the, the, the ceiling is describing part of a sphere and the center of the sphere is below the floor, the floor. of the circular room, wow. which makes it incredibly yeah. difficult to actually lay it out and, and measure it properly. Yeah, to check yeah. your work. To check the work, yes. It's Yeah, how do you just I don't know. How like do you do it they... without lasers? <laughs> and like computers know. that can do calculations for you. It's a madness. And so this is the one, yeah, this is the specific room where you stand in the middle of a circle. I'm we're gonna call it the healing chamber because one thing I'm it's... noticing too that I, but wait before you get rid of that, uh that the circular room, it's so the interior wall there around by the door, you see one circle and then the doorway or the exterior wall of the circular room is a different circle. Looks like it has. It, it looks like it's. Uh, it's a much bigger circle. It's not. Yes. It, what am I saying? It's tapering down as it approaches the door. So I wonder what the yeah. radius, the two radii of those two circles. I yeah. wonder how they relate to each other. Yeah. It'd be yeah, interesting if, if they the were the one, golden the, ratio. This, yeah. Yeah. Which ones? The golden one. It, do, it and this this is mad. It just it honestly looks like it. This also reminded me of like the internal of the Great Pyramid, which seems so mechanical and like machine ish to me. Yes. Um, this this looked like a crazy space age. I don't understand why more people aren't literally wetting themselves over the Barbar caves. They are so incredible. Like I don't understand why mainstream aren't 
boggling at them um, because this, according to the mainstream story, these caves were built uh, um, to honor the gods in a like for the rain or something. Like there was like a, a period of bad rain or monsoon, and they they wanted to like make these caves in order to stay safe or something. Um, I'm like, what? what? That, what? Yeah, that doesn't seem well. Why would you? Why would they need to be this shape? Is that, why would they need? Is that based on them reading the text that's written on the wall in the one room? Yeah. So on the um, on the wall uh, in the on in one of the rooms, um, this is this is where the, I've got the image up here now. You can see like etch a sketched in yes. to this like precision wall cut through the polish. Um, yeah, they've literally like scraped in and they've written and so apparently that's what it says um you know they, that's how they can date these apparently all of the caves because of this writing and it dates to like 2300 uh bc and it still dates long. to this particular king i mean still an amazingly long time but yeah, still but a it, long time ago but that's yeah it's a really random place to put the writing as well it's just kind of slapped on one wall on one side as you're going in um there doesn't see like the whole rest of the design seems to be so meticulous and thought out. And then why would you, Oh, we'll just put it, uh, here we'll do and just sort of slap it on the side. <laughs> um, there's no symmetry to it. The whole thing, the, all this stuff is symmetrical. You'd at least put it on either side. Like my OCD would be going crazy. Like, <laughs> want to put writing on both sides or none at all guys. Um, but yeah, that, that's literally the only way that they can, that they can date it. And apparently it's, it's sort of, symbolic for the rain or something but that doesn't mean why it why would really they make be... sense yeah yeah especially because all the other architecture from around that time just doesn't look like this so right. why why would you if i was gonna do like a shrine to the the gods for the rain i would i'd make it really pretty like these caves are impressive but they're not pretty or beautiful or yeah yeah they you... just don't they you're not screaming at me. Yeah, God, and you can't. The rain. You can't see them without going inside. Like otherwise, I mean, if you're outside where the gods of rains are, like in other words, the clouds <laughs> in the sky, the gods yeah. of rains are going to see like a hole in the in the in the rock. Whereas a temple is something that's exterior and you can see it. You know, if you're a god. In the Maybe sky. that's why they were unfinished. Because someone was like, um, Yeah, Barnabas, did you did you not think this through? Because the gods can't see the caves. <laughs> yeah, and they're like. Oh, damn it. You're right. Yeah. This is really damn beautiful it. walls here, but uh, you have to kind of coincide to see it. Yeah. Uh, like, it yeah, just the gods. Yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> Back to square one. But, um, um, okay. What else? Oh, so here's the um, image of the the unfinished cave where they're starting to do, again, like this is more typical Indian, beautiful, yes. ornate, nice curly whirly gate outside. And, um, it, this stuff is it's on the wonk it's not precise and why would the outside not be precise and the inside be precise it's if you were the same person that was doing the outside and the inside it would be identical in in quality and it isn't so that this for me like cements what party i'm in i think that this outside was done around the time period that the writing was because it fits the style um and yeah, yeah that makes sense to me too and, and they kind of make this point in the documentary it's not quite uh, vertical uh, the corners aren't as well done the precision of the lines aren't as well done and there's gaps you know there's the flatness of the surfaces yeah. of the pillars and stuff are just yeah I think the guy said the guy said this is like you know second class work really good <clears throat> but, if, but if the interior is like first class this is second class so this is where I as a newbie to this sort of um, subject like over a year ago two years ago this is where I didn't understand what I was looking at or why this stuff was so impressive because I kind of went to Egypt going with like a blank mind going, okay, what is this? Like educate me, everybody. And I was so lucky. I got to go with a whole bunch of like stonemasons, guys who'd been working in this field for like 20, 30 years. And they got to explain to me, it is all in the details. So if you're an amateur at this and you're just getting into the subject, like this looks straight if i didn't have that red line that's in the going down the center of the picture i'd be like yeah that's pretty straight like um <laughs> i would be like yeah it's beautiful what's the problem so when you're looking at all these ancient sites it's literally in the tiny tiny details and when people are arguing against sort of more mainstream stuff rather or alternative it's all in these very minute um 
problems that that appear and then when you when you start to see them you can then start seeing them everywhere and i'm like oh yeah and yes. but before I, I i wouldn't have appreciated like a drill hole or um yeah you know anything yeah. like that yeah the drill holes or just just i mean even if you're talk, talking about engineering in terms of precision it's like you really have to you know talk about details some of them you can't see with the naked eye you know, like to, to be able to measure the precision of the flatness of the, you know, the interior of the walls of these things that like it requires equipment because, you know, one polished surface looks much like another to the, to the naked eye. Oh, it looks <laughs> glassy. It kind of looks flat. But until you actually start measuring it and then you can say, well, this one is actually, you know, flat to a certain amount, whereas this one is flat to a much smaller amount than that. Uh, therefore, far more precise, you know, something you can't see, you can't even feel it with your fingers. And recently I had, a, I, I do admit I had in my research, I had a little bit of a, of a wobble where I was like, oh my God, oh my God, have, have I got it wrong? Because there is a lot of videos that are circling on the internet and like I get sent them by people going, but what about this? And I'm like, okay, let me look at it. Um, there's a channel out there called scientists against myths, I yep. think. And they do some very good videos, um, that on the surface do debunk absolutely everything that we're talking about, um, which is why I was like, okay, I got to like re-research this. I spoke, I reached out to Christopher Dunn. I reached out to Ben. I was like, guys, you yeah. help me. My, my face is out. on the line here. <laughs> like, well, <laughs> please bring me back in. But, um, but then in speaking to them, that's when I get, again, I understood that on the surface, yes, you can kind of replicate some of this ancient stuff. Um, using the tools and um there was like a lady who carved it was specifically the serapian boxes i think this video that i saw and this lady took 40 hours but she carved in granite with hand tools she carved like a precise corner and i was like and side by side with the ones in the serapium i was like oh damn you can do it by hand with like a copper chisel um i don't think she used copper actually that's one of the things but um but looking back at it again, and there's what well, there's another guy who can um, show that you can like really flatten granite. But yeah, um, you can flatten he, surfaces by hand. Yeah, uh, like an yeah, outside surface. Yeah, with lapstone. Uh, like a, f yeah. but where yeah. they can't replicate it, they can't replicate anything that's detailed or like too delicate that a massive slab of flat. Because um, you have to basically put granite and then your sand and water and then you put a massive slab on top of that and shimmy it back and forth and it sounds horrendous and you have to do it for like hours. But yeah. it does make a be beautifully flat surface. But they can't replicate that same thing on intricate things, curves. And I'm looking at the Barbar Caves and this whole thing's on a curve. Like yeah. you, there's no way you can go around with like a brick of granite and smooth this out. There, there had to have been other tools. Um, it's the Serapium is one thing. It's all straight, but this is curved at every angle. Um, and I remember in one of their videos, um, scientists against myths, they said that they'd reached out to like a granite company and said, could you make a Serapian box? And they were like, yeah, it would cost 225,000 pounds or dollars. Um, and they could make it 80% by hand. And they were like, see, it's possible. And I was like, wait, 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 80% <laughs> by hand, but these were made a hundred percent by hand. So unless you can make it hundred percent by hand, then you haven't proved anything. Yeah. And they were literally like, see, all you need is 225 grand and we could make one for you. I was like, but 80%, <laughs> Yes. you could make 80% of this box, but you couldn't make the whole thing. So that's right. We're going to still argue about this dude. Um, <laughs> And I was right. back in the seat and ready to go. But but yeah, it, it really does come down to like the details of it. So when people are watching these videos that are coming in that on the surface, like really do look really convincing, um, you know, go find a more adulty ancient history person and get them to explain the details because that's where all the, the, the wonder lies. That's right. I agree with that. Um, yeah, science against scientists against myths. And then the other one is like, uh, what is it? Sacred geometry decoded. They do a lot of the debunkery as well yeah there's a but also one thing that i'm i'm, I'm really up for debating anybody about this although i love talking about ancient history to anyone that will listen um literally like on the bus whatever i'll be like hi yeah um <laughs> but i find it hard when um when people are quite mean about it like i would never be mean to somebody if somebody yes. wants to believe the, main, the mainstream if you want to believe the pyramids of tomb go for it. Like, that's what you want to believe. Cool. Like, let's talk about why, because I'm really interested. Um, but I think a lot of these channels, they, they literally mock people who think differently to them. And then that's where I get a little bit like, well, I kind of don't want to engage with that because yes, I agree. I, yeah. I won't, unless I'm not going to be mean to you. So, um, yeah. And they, it can be quite, it's, 
the internet's nasty enough already. Let's yeah. not make it even more of a yeah, weird place. I agree with that. Well, going back real um, quick on the the idea that that you know they can make the Serapium boxes by hand. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, or I'm thinking, obviously they mean with tools by hand, right? With hand tools, they're not actually talking about making it with their hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think they're talking about like you can chisel it out. Yes. Like it's possible okay, to so that's my it. point is that uh-huh. like that they they can say I I think that the Serapian boxes may well have been made by hand with tools mm. that allowed them to do incredible precision. Yeah, tools that we haven't discovered. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we haven't discovered. Right. Like it's it's hard to believe that they had some kind of big. CNC machine built inside the Serapium. There's not enough room for that. So yeah, I think um, uh, and and that the yeah, sur- he- the surfaces are not always 100% flat. You know, they they do have some variation. It does look like a lot of this work was done by hand, but it's incredibly precise. So the whatever the tools were that they were using allowed them to create these boxes at incredible precision. And uh, but there still may have been hand hand tools. You know what I'm saying? Get yeah, I that? think that like, you can. That's what they're saying at Barabar Bar as well. That um, handmade can be. You can have something can be made by hand with a machined tool. Right. Like, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right. You can be you can be hand gliding some sort of tool that is got energy in it and, and then, things or like oscillating right. or whatever. And then your and then your precision is based on like you know the skill at which you use the tool and also your tools for measuring your precision. So in this in the case for the the round cave, how are they measuring that curve? Like it's I don't know if people realize how profound that is that this curve actually describes a circle. You know, it's one thing yeah. to say, well, I'm going to make a wall go up and then I'm going to kind of curve into the roof and curve around to another wall. There's no reason that if you're making that, that that curve is going to describe a circle. But the whole exactly. roof line describes a circle. It describes an arc on the perimeter, on the of, a perimeter of a circle, yeah. which is much larger than the the part of the arc that they carve. That's that's incredible. Yeah. And, and so you have to even if you're doing it by hand, you have to be able to check with some measurement tool to say, am I still on that arc of this circle or do I need to go a little deeper? And then in the case that you might have gone too deep, you have to go back and carve away the rest of the material to make the circle or the arc for a bigger circle. So yeah. it's, uh, it's I mean, quite incredible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe these caves were supposed to be really small and they've got this big because people just kept going, nope, <laughs> nope. <laughs> Keep- That's the first time they got it right. That's how yeah. big it had. It to was be. supposed to be just a little shrine to the gods, and then it just became this huge room. Um, like now, nah, nah, I just put it a little bit back in it. Fine, dust it off. But, and I think I think it's not out of the um, realm of impossibility. We've we've found weird pieces of machine things in history, like the Antica. Yes. Yeah. mechanism. Antikythera. Antikythera. That's yeah. the one. The anti mechanism. <laughs> and um, yeah. Oh my gosh, guys. By the way, I, I there were so many bloopers of me trying to do, uh, trying to pronounce all of the name places all over uh, the world. Yeah, I, I got, I got given in the documentary. I had at, at speed had to just hit some of these things, and it was just not going well. <laughs> um, I could probably make a really funny video of just all of my attempts at butchering these amazing ancient cultural <laughs> yeah. sites. Um, we got That's, it down in the end, but oh my God. Yeah. Well, we have a long tradition of totally mispronouncing stuff and butchering names on this podcast as well. So you fit right in. It's not a problem. <laughs> Great. Oh yeah. Didn't you used to say like Serapium? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We've, <laughs> we've mispronounced many, many things. Yeah. Great. My name's one for that. No one can say my name properly. I'm just used to it. Like I've had so many people, I spe- my name has got so many A's and N's uh, and H's and stuff. People are just like, Johanna. And I'm like, yeah, it's good. If it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Jana, like, great. Yeah, whatever. But yeah, it's all about just give it a go. Just if you're saying it with confidence, I think it, you, people just buy it, right? Yeah, just, just lean into it. Yeah. yeah, just go for it. Just <laughs> say it with gusto and just give it a go. That's but, right. um, well, let's yeah. take let's take one more break and then we'll come back for the final second segment with Johanna. J J J Yeah. Joan Yar Yar Harner. 
Rocket. Whatever. Uh, Let's take a break. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, final segment, Brothers of the Serpent, episode uh, 244. 244, that's right. With Johanna James, uh, and we're going to look at uh, a few more things that we've been talking about in terms of precision, possibly doing it by hand, uh, some of the things that skeptics have said, maybe, and uh, maybe a few things about Johanna's other projects. So oh, yeah. yeah. Me... Got lots of stuff in the barrel. <laughs> I don't think that's a saying, but I'm going to coin it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> in the barrel. Well, I mean, we're, we, are, we are winemakers, so. Ah, that that's sense. a nah, great segue. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I was just pulling up some of these images. So just uh, skipping back to when I was having a moment of um, floundering in my face. Um, I watched this video about the Serapium and because the Serapium was possibly my top favorite place in the world like smoking gun ever evidence everywhere so yeah. this shook me however i came away with from the video with a with one theory about how they actually moved the blocks that i was like you know what they might have be onto something here and so they're saying that um obviously it's physically impossible for um just a couple of guys to lift this stuff it's you need like at, between 200 and 300 men and the problem is you physically can't fit 200 men in the Serapian walls because, I mean, the tunnels, because they're so tiny. Right. Um, however, they worked out apparently with physics that you would only need around 30 to 50 men um, if you could put um, the boxes on a pulley system. And so let me just pull um, some images. So already here. they're getting past the standard model here. Yeah, let's give them some wheels. Let's give them wheels, which the standard model says. Well, at least in the so, old kingdom, they didn't have wheels. Yeah. So if this is if this is dated to, so, go ahead. So this was like roller blocks. So they're saying that if they had um, on on like a roller block, or I guess even if it was on a on a, a sort of sledge thing with 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 weights, uh, with um something to slide it along, and then um, attach the uh, the block with with like a pulley system, and then. Physics wise, it would only take like 30 to 50 men um, to sort of pull this thing. And what's interesting is so when you get around the, um, the corner, because they're very tight spaces that they have to get these things into, there is actually a hole that I never noticed. And while I was there, I was so excited. They have like a kind of um, what where a wooden beam could have been. Um, yeah, two at the sockets on either side of the wall. Yeah, yeah, and it's up high, and it's where there could have been a wooden beam, which would make total sense if you were having some kind of pulley system. You could lever this thing around with a small amount of men. And there's a reason also why um, the uh, the like each little cavern where the the boxes are is so low. You have to really get like kind of ten foot down. Yeah. Um, which I was like, how did they even get that down there? But um, there was one of the boxes that was recorded um, when they first went in there. I'm not sure who it was that found it, but um, one of them was still being lowered with um, a bit of sand and they mm -hmm. removed the sand and apparently they put the last block into place because it hadn't quite gone all the way down. So that makes sense for not all of them, because I spoke to Ben and he said, well, the one at the end, is, it's not the case for that one, but for the ones where they would have to be lowered, like kind of 10 foot from the level of the floor, it, it is possible that they could have filled it with, filled sand, it with sand, like yep. slid it along, um, because one of them does have that evidence for sand. So I was like, okay, so this is a theory using, um, and oh yeah, so also one other piece of instrument, they actually found in there, they found these, forgot the name you know like a kind of turny wheel that everybody can push yes <laughs> um i can't what i don't remember what they're called but they kind of look like a bicycle wheel everybody can take a thing and push it round and round yep. a kind of many point they found a couple of these in the therapium um not to say that they weren't brought in later by later people doing things and left behind. Like it doesn't, the per it doesn't say that the people who made the box left those things, but they did find them in there. So yeah, that's the people who were possible. taking the lids off. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, but if you had the if you had the beams at the back, um, like a, a, a pulley system, um, uh, and yeah, um, that, that does make it, sense. It's interesting though the box that's in the hallway. You know, Ben has talked about this too. The box maybe maybe he told you about this. The box that's in the hallway that's sitting on the floor. Mm. That's a huge mistake. If this is your if this is your process. In other words, it's on a sled and the sled is on rollers. Yeah. And then you take it off the rollers and off the sled. You can't ever move it again with that process without getting it back up on the sled somehow and up on the rollers. And none of this helps you pick the box up. Yeah. So in other yeah. words, where, so did that, the, where did the sled and the rollers go on that box that's in the hallway that was obviously in the – did they just say, well, just put it down in the hall and just leave it there? You know, we're never going to move it again. Yeah. In other yeah, words, it's weird, it's weird that it's blocking the whole thing. Yeah, it's like, blocking this the is... hallway, and it isn't sitting on a sled or on any rollers, and there's no wood that's ever been found underneath it. So it isn't like it sat there and that wood disintegrated because there would still be fragments, you know, of it under there. Yeah, yeah. it's on the floor. It's weird they that you would leave it like it's such an eyesore it's ruining the rest of the project if i was the designer of that project i'd be like smash it up move it out you yeah know. It, yes um, it implies just, it implies that whatever method they were using to move it did not require sleds and rollers and that and that whoever was in the process of moving it never finished the job for some reason well the the only other thing i can think of is literally like levitating these things like balloons in there. Like that's the only thing that my brain goes to because I'm like, okay, you physically can't lift it, but you put push and pull it technically. Yeah. That's the only way like in our realm of physics that I can think of. Um, and the fact that they found the twirly wooden swirly things, technical name. You could also and install something. It is cut out. The, the, that box has the interior sort of roughed out. So you mm. could install something that would... I don't know, have a series of cams and like offset weights that you would put inside it that would, uh, that would, uh, like, what would you call it? It would mount to the interior walls and then you turn it on and when it and spins, it vibrates. it vibrates the whole box and then you, and then you just, just slide the, the thing down the hallway because hey. it would be vibrating. But well, that, there we go. Well, that'd be kind of terrifying theory. down in a cave like that though. <laughs> yeah, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the box. Yeah. Once you get just it going. going. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. It's like a Dalek. <laughs> Just, yeah. Exterminate, exterminate. Great. Um, but yeah, that's but that interesting. Was so, so you're saying in the alcoves, there are there are sockets in the upper walls of the alcove, of every alcove? Yes. Okay, that's cool. Um, I want to yes. check that out. Yeah. yeah. So that there's, so there's uh, if you look at, you know, you don't tend to look at the yeah. back and up because everyone's looking, looking at, the at, the, yeah. at the boxes. But if you do, if you look at back and up, there are these two like identical where there would have been, obviously the wood's gone and deteriorated yeah. now, but there would have been a beam, which is in perfect placement for if you were going to hook a pulley round and be able to cool. slide this thing, if there was any way you could yeah. get it onto some kind of thing, um, then yeah, like it would be, it, it's, 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 in my mind, I'm putting it down as a possibility and I'm walking away sure. from, from yeah. that exchange. Going, yeah, because okay, the, like, maybe. whoever did it had to move them somehow. <laughs> so I think the sand idea in the in the in the alcoves is a great idea. Uh, and I definitely want to check out those, you know, beam sockets. Check out the I, beams. I would be because it's an it, it's hard to imagine that a, a wooden beam. I mean, I guess if it was on rollers though, on rollers and able to glide easier. But yeah, just sitting it's, on the ground, I don't think a wooden beam pulley system would work. Yeah, just too heavy. And it'd be fun to watch Maybe. them. It'd be fun to watch them try to make it go around a corner when it's on a bunch of rollers. That might be a fun process to watch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, Maybe I like. Could, like I, slip I like, and slide it. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You need to oil with your... like a load of cow grease or something. <laughs> they just slip and slide those. They just slip. They just ice skated right down. Yep. Um, but yeah, so this was a way that I was like, okay. And then there was something that it was interesting that they said that 30 men, according to physics, that would be enough for the, for the, like the 80 tons that would be needed to move on a pulley system. Yeah. 30 men could move 80 tons. And interesting in one of the like papyruses for the Serapium, they, um, there's like a, a, a bill of reference for 30 workers. So it, it, it was some, it was another thing that I was like, okay. Okay, there's a there's yeah. a we have a receipt yeah. for 30 workers and science says 30 workers could technically pull 80 tons or whatever. Right. So, so you have uh, to have rope that can handle 80 tons, you have to have a pulley that can handle 80 tons. Yeah. 
Yeah. So and the bee. Where where are those the in the records? Yeah. Um, but um, but I mean the ropes in the wood is obviously way gone. But um, apart from the wooden. Yeah, I think that wood. I think that wood, thing. The wood should still be there. The ropes would probably be gone, but I don't think the wood would deteriorate down in a protected uh, cavern like that. It should last a long time. Yeah, I mean, there was still wood in some of the pyramids. You yeah, know? I think the wood would last a oh, long time true. down there. Yeah, it's just not there. So either maybe somebody, someone took it out. Maybe, somebody somebody made it. Gonna... Yeah. maybe it was not made of Look wood. The... <laughs> yeah. Maybe it wasn't wood. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're just assuming it's a wooden beam. It could have been anything. Yeah. But that is something that's the it, the wheel wasn't supposed to be invented. So, but they did have that like wheel turn system. You'd have to you you have to use that to with yeah. the rope. So. Yeah, well, I think that I think the the uh, where's the watcher when you need him? Uh, the the standard model dating for the Serapium is not Old Kingdom, so they probably would have. Had oh, okay. Wheel. Yeah. I'll look. Oh, uh, interesting. But um, and then but, again, yeah. you still have the mystery of like how you know if they were down there with roughed out boxes, and then they put the roughed out box in place, and then finished it in place. What were they using to light the area? And then how did they deal with the dust? From- Same problem as Barba. Yeah. Like, who is the dust man on this one? <laughs> got a really bad job. It's a big, there's a line of 30 guys with like feather fans, you know? <laughs> do, do you guys, you guys know that there's 20 more boxes, right? I've heard that We've there's heard another rumors, section of yeah. boxes. Where? Yeah. yeah when we boxes. were down, they were, they were down there and the guy was like, off the record, um, we think we found another tunnel. We estimate there's another 20 like boxes unopened, but we can't get there because it's just full of thousands of years of rubble. Yeah. Um, so we need it. We need, we need funding. I'm like, Elon Musk, come yeah, on. We'll get that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it's, uh, they, you know, Wikipedia. So total standard model here dates the, um, the Serapium to founded in 1400 BC and abandoned at 30 BC. So that would start in the new kingdom. That would be, Kingdom, me. Amateurs. The theatered, yeah, amateurs, right? But that's that's the standard of all dating. So they probably would have had the wheel at that point. Uh, okay. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Well, this is this is food for thought. Yeah, Love yeah. That. All of it's food for thought. Yes. Thank you. Good stuff. And yeah, this is this is yeah. And then the other thing that I, I I pulled up, I think I mentioned it earlier, was about the corner of the Serapium. But you just brilliantly noticed that whereas the inner serapium they would be creating a corner in the middle of a box they just created a corner out of the corner of a box so the outside yeah the outside corner where the outside corner where you can yes where you can magically get to places that you put your hand in places that you cannot do on an inside corner inside the boxes because you're working the outside yeah yeah so if you have to do it again, we'd have to create like a cardboard wall and be like, you can't, right. you can't carve past the wall. That's right. Not yeah. allowed. You can't get your hand it's... in a position that's like parallel with the line that you're carving. Yeah. Because there would, inside an actual Serapium box, there'd be a wall there in your way. So you would be working only from interior angles. That's right. Exactly. So, and it's things like that again. It's that like little detail that initially, when you're watching the video, you're like, oh damn, yeah, they could do it. And then you're like, no, the, the detail is in the design. That's the right. Devil's yeah. in the detail. The there devil we are. is in the details. Um. Oh God, amazing. And the other thing that Russ pointed out here is that the picture that they have of this interior corner in a Serapium box is not the best example. Yes, uh, by far it's that not is not the best example, and, and they like, picked the worst one. Yeah, so that doesn't fair. even look like the same stone as the. Uh, I mean, like, so I'd say that they picked one of the limestone boxes that's in there. Well, I don't know. The point is, is that Chris is like Chris Dunn lays out this idea that like you need to take the most difficult aspects of the work and reproduce those. Yeah, not the easiest. Not the yeah. worst aspects of the work and then do it a little bit better and be like, see, I can even do it better. Like, yeah. That's not, yeah. Yeah, you have to take the most difficult and the, you have to look at all the details of the work and then find a method that can replicate the most difficult to understand or, you know, difficult details, not just part of them, you know, or kind of make it look like them. Yeah. Yeah. And as well, something that I've realized when I, in, in having this sort of long time uh, sort of debate with, with my dad, uh, there is something that 
sometimes you're never going to change someone's view because they sort of see it through a lens that they want to see it through. And I have to always check myself as well, because I really do want, you know, cool ancient history stuff to come out. So sometimes I do look at stuff because I really want to see, and I have to sort of take a step back and go, okay, come on, like, let's look at this completely neutrally. And then if, even if it's not the most excitable answer, what is the answer? Um, And that has to be coming from both sides because some people, they're just so, kind of bottlenosed into their one way. Yeah. Um, it's, it's almost not worth having a conversation with them or an argument about it because they're not going to be at the end of the day, they're never going to see it any other way. That's right. Which is a shame. And that happens on both sides. I completely agree. Yeah. You, like, yeah. you have to recognize your, your bias. Like I, I also have a tendency. I want, uh, like, I think it would be so awesome if we did find like legitimately found the smoking gun of a, you know, pre, end of ice age civilization that may have seeded all these, um, you know, ancient civilizations that we do know about and passed on knowledge. I think that would be great. So I do have a tendency to like, want to look at this and say, wow, yeah, maybe this is a sign of that civilization. So yeah, you got to check yourself. Yeah. And well, we also have a joke, a sort of a joking thing we say on the podcast, which is like, well, the standard model, we've all heard that story. So let's, (laughs) let's, let's tell a different one, you know, let's like, yes, we understand that that's there's this idea that they could do all this by hand and with a million guys with ropes who are only wearing butt flaps, right? Like everyone knows that story. <laughs> so let's talk about the possibility that it was actually using, you know, uh, high technology or that it's a legacy of high technology even. Uh, and that there's just thousands and thousands of years of cultural layers on top of that, which again, in the Builders of the Ancient Mystery documentary, they show this so well. You know, they show this in Peru and, and in Egypt where you see – You know, like down at the bottom, you have these massive stones that are like precisely aligned with each other and balanced and everything. And then on the top where there seems to have been repair work or additions, the the, the masonry is is far, far lower in quality. So it does it it does look like the the work gets more complicated and more advanced the, the farther back you go in some cases. And one thing that nobody can, can, has any answer to, um, and I've, I've like looking through these videos, it, you're talking about like the the, the nit, nit, nit bits of like carving this stuff. Nobody has an answer to that that polishing effect that you see at Barabar. Okay, you see yeah, Egypt, I that was going to ask you about glass. that. No, and I and I that's what I was waiting for because I was like, okay, but what about the polishing? And <laughs> they just didn't even didn't even mention it. Um, they they can't because they're literally that is the big big mystery because the, some of those like Egyptian heads I remember in like the Karnak temple I was touching them no I didn't touch them but I did and <laughs> they were it, it was I was like this thing is thousands of years old and it looks like it was made yesterday it is so smooth and polished mm. and it's something that is only yeah. appears in that that really early dynasty like the old yes, stuff that's right the New Kingdom stuff didn't have that shiny amazing polish that you can see at Baraba, that you can see uh, in the Serapium. And there is no, they don't even have an answer. They don't even put it in the videos um, of the, like the debunking videos. Yeah, so I was going to ask you about that. If you guys are, or at least that the team, uh, the Builders of the Ancient Mysteries team is going back, are they going to do the, the kind of, um, I don't know what the test is called, but basically where you optically examine the surface of this glossy polish to see, can we find micro microscopic polishing marks or is it just completely glassy which would imply high technology because like you you know a lot of times with when you're looking at ancient polish if you look at it under a microscope you can actually see millions of little bitty scratches because it was polished with you know some kind of sand Uh, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah Well, I'll be taking my iPhone, so I will have some great quality pictures that we can examine. That thing can go you can you can go in like times two. So <laughs> that's gonna be great. Get buy, buy a little external, you know, microscope for the iPhone. Just plug it in. I'll just take a phone yeah, and... a microscope headset and just have a little look. <laughs> But y'all let initials here, guys. Microscopic <laughs> initials. <laughs> well, it's the just, artist. It's There's just a, interesting yeah. because there's, you know, at least Yusuf, and I know you've 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 gone through the the Serapium with Yusuf, so he does ask the question: mm. Is like, was this polish applied with some kind of liquid? Like it appears on the, you know, some of the lower edges of the boxes. I think so yeah. because. 
Uh, sorry, go on. Well, I'm just saying, like, if it's applied by a liquid, there aren't going to be the sanding scratches when you observe the surface microscopically. That's true, because it's, you know, yeah, it's, it fizzed is. it away or whatever it does. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be interesting um, to find out if they're like, because these guys, you know, the builders of the Ancient Mysteries crew, they're going to go to back to these caves and they're going to do better scans and everything. I'm just be interested if they're going to try to study the polish. I think they should for sure. I will. I'll ask Patrice. I'll be like, yo, we got to get some microscopes. Yeah. In there. Tell them, tell them um, Snake Bros demand science on the polish. <laughs> <laughs> Depend the polish. The, there is a, a site in Egypt, the, um, there is the, it's, I think it's called the Unfinished Pyramid. No, um, oh God, forgot the name. It's very late in the day here where I am in London. Apologies. But there is uh, one of my secret favorite sites in Egypt is one that no, absolutely nobody can go to because it's now on a military zone. It's like cordoned off. Oh yes, um, the, is that the pit? At Zariat yeah. El Har And you can go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, there are, luckily there are some surviving photos from like the yes. sort of the turn of the century. And this sarcophagi is probably the, like, it's the most unusual one because it's in a very barbar shape. It's in that weird sort of, it's like a circular oval. Yeah, it's an oval. Um, yep. And it's down in the ground. Like it looks like a bathtub, like a kind of ceremonial bathtub in the center of this pyramid. And when it had, when they found it, it was like, like a good record because they took the lid, the lid was sealed on with like this kind of lime stuff. And they, they unsealed the pyramid for the first time since literally forever. And they found residue of um, like, like a black sticky residue inside the, the That's tub. That's right. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. So I, I, I always think like, okay, so, you know, there was probably alchemy and elements and liquids and things that obviously they're now all gone in the main sites that we go to but these ones that are like not touched and that particular one has a record of this sarcophagi being full of like something sticky um so i do wonder and 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 it's physically possible um there's a bird in like south america that um it regurg it like vomits up some sort of vomit yeah. <laughs> and it that's how they make their bed it, it melts the stone and then they can make a little bed to lie on yes, um, we're talking about the legends of the shamir yeah getting close to the old shamir here ah yeah <laughs> well that, so i think okay so in in nature there's a bird that can make that can melt stone with its vomit so it's not impossible that there could be some liquid there yep that could do this yeah <clears throat> i think that's supposed to work on like uh, sedimentary like so limestones or calcites I don't know if it would work uh, on granite. That's the question. Granite. It's like once you get to igneous rock, it complete. It's a whole different chemistry. And will it work on well, all I stone? Will vomit. Is that bird real? Yeah. <laughs> there are there are stories. I will give it a go. Because I heard that it was stories about a bird that could do this. Yeah. But I don't oh. Know that it's... Well, damn it. Maybe I'll. Um, maybe I'm actually repeating like some sort of myth there. Well, <laughs> but, well, oh, I thought I'm, it was yeah, a no, real no. bird. I don't know. I've just, okay. I've, I've, I have also read the same thing. I've never been able to really completely verify that this. Okay. I'm going to get to Googling. That doesn't mean that it isn't real. Yeah. yeah I just, remember looking into this because of looking into the legends of the Shamir and there was a comparison to a, cause the Shamir legends are more like, you know, Africa and stuff. And then, uh, um, there's another like seemingly equivalent legend, but it's from South America, I think. Yeah. Right. And that's the one with the bird. Yeah. That has that can actually like melt stone. Um, that it, either it vomits or it eats a plant that has stuff. Yeah. In it, then it, it brings it vomits a plant or it then, brings yeah. a plant. It, it's like the stories are all and so mixed up. The legends of the <laughs> Shamir. Yeah. In are are that a bird guards it. It's weird. Yeah, so that's right. So the Shamir being more like an African legend, it has this bird that guards it, and the bird will go get the Shamir and use it, you know, to break the stone or something like that. And so it's just weird how they both have a bird yeah. having to do with them, and they're com completely different mm -hmm. continents and different time periods. Yeah. So obviously the I bird is actually a spaceship, and it has a laser. Ah, 
That's what we're talking about here. Yeah. yeah. Laser vomit. Vomit laser. <laughs> That's right. <It's, laughs> it goes <Yeah. laughs> and it shoots the laser. That's <laughs> That's the yeah, that's it. Great. <laughs> that makes sense. That's what they were talking. They were like, oh, this bird in the sky that vomits fire and it melts stone. Obviously, yes. it was a plane with a laser. We that's get it right. Now. I tra- see, see, I'm a translator, the, guys. And the goo, I translate. That's right. The goo that was in the sarcophagus that you were talking about is just the remnants of the alien. I mean, that, that's what they turn into when they. It just melted. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> stuck. Just- <laughs> It's just <laughs> ew. Oh, that guy's like, what? What is this substance? Hmm. It's like yeah. it's melted alien goo. Guys. That's right. It's literally alien goo. Well, no wonder we it, got, it's not open to time. tourists. Do we have more time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought we were out of time. No, that's oh. no, because I started this later. Oh, so we got a little bit more. Okay. Um, there was, uh, I can't remember. There was one other thing. I know we, I wanted to talk about the. There in in the film, uh, the BAM film, one of my mm-hmm. favorite parts as well was the Antikythera uh, mechanism. Yeah, the stuff they, they did that on was that. really that well was, done with great graphics. Yeah, sure. really good yeah. graphics on that. I hadn't known a, a lot of those facts that they they threw out about that thing. I love the the aspect of like how the moon's orbit, you know, because the well any orbit of a planet it changes speed as it gets closer or further away from. Whatever body is primary, primary. yeah, and the way the gears were set to like sort of like their cogs are like longer so that they could get one could get closer to the other one and then back further away so that it would change how fast it moved. Yeah, it's genius. And it was all activated by one push of a button, like one push of a cog could start that. It 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 was button. It's like turn it on, turn it off technology. Yeah, was was happening back then. It, it it that does make me think it is by sheer luck and accident that that machine is still with us, or was even discovered because it was on the bottom of a shipwreck, which kind of weirdly preserved it in a little capsule. And then now we can. It, well, as soon as they brought it out of the water, it started to disintegrate, so it won't be here for long. But it does make me think, like, what about all the things that didn't accidentally fall to the bottom of the ocean? Yeah. Um, it, it, it makes total sense that if we're talking about things so, so far back, it, that it would all be gone, which I guess is like, oh, yes, it's all gone. Lucky for you. That's a great answer. But I'm like, no, no, literally, it will be gone. like the Titanic. I think someone said that the rate that the Titanic is um, disintegrating, because they sent people down a few years ago to do tests and they were like, it's deteriorating so fast because it's being eaten by some sort of underwater bacteria thing they're like we won't have it in like 100 200 years it will be gone it's crazy that's right and that's the titanic will have disappeared within a few hundred years and we're talking about ten thousand, maybe twenty thousand years of history i was like okay it's gonna be gone yeah yes gone Um, and you know we were just watching that and they were showing all this stuff about the antikythera medicine you know and there's just it just doesn't seem to match up with I mean, because uh, you know that the the timing of it like was it greek was it roman you know, and like, it just doesn't seem to match up with what we understand about their technological level and their capability level of like cutting out, making gears that are that, you know, it's just very difficult. So to me, uh, when I was watching it, I was just like, okay, they found this in some kind of chamber like the the Barabar Caves in India. In other words, they opened up something and it was full of treasure of, of things like that, that had been preserved yeah. by the ancient civilization. And then they're transporting it to Rome and then the ship sinks, you know. So t- that's what I thought of immediately. It was like it is a relic of an ancient civilization and they tried to preserve it. The Romans or whoever found it. Ah, it was on the way. Yeah, yeah. it was on the way to museum yeah. when, it, when, it, when it went under. Yeah. That's a story. Because, they, I, you know, in other words, just like with the other stuff we're saying elsewhere, that, that it wasn't built by the people who were transporting it on the ship yeah. or their civilization. It was a relic mm-hmm. to them. Yeah, it's like this schist disc. Yeah, right. Was found in a tomb with some prince, you know, prince or whatever. Yeah. So it's like I, I love thinking of that as like they found this and it was an artifact that they revered at that time. Yeah. And they're yes. like, yeah, bury this. You know, like I want to be buried with the best arrowhead I ever found. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's like this yeah. is an awesome ancient artifact, and bury me with it. I don't know. Yeah. And so if somebody it's digs- always the older tombs, the oldest tombs have the coolest stuff and like the high techest stuff. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this in. So this is a replica ring 
of what they call the uh, Luxor ring or the Atlantis ring, because it was found, I'm going to bring it right up to the screen here so you can see, it's full of um, sacred geometry. Ah. And it it was found in a tomb of a second dynasty priest. He was buried with this, well, not this one. Um, and he, um, they, they found it, um, where did they find it? Well, whenever they opened the tomb, like in the 1800s, 1860s, I think. And anyways, this like really old, early priest had this like crazy ring that was full of sacred geometry. And it's got like pyramid shapes, um, kind of three uh, obelisky. T- it looks like a kind of obelisk stretched around a ring, uh, but it also oh, has I holes see. in the side. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you see the kind of mm-hmm. yeah. it, very py- pyramid obelisk shape to it? Yep. So anyway, they found this ring. Um Somehow, uh, the archaeologist who who got it um, ended up gifting it to Howard Carter, who went into the Tutankhamun yeah. cave, uh, cave tomb, not the cave. <laughs> and um, there was that big kind of conspiracy with that because out of the like twenty or so people that went in, um, there was the curse that was written yes, over. So yes, bunch go of them in, died, yeah. and like like literally like 18, 19 of them died and Howard Carter was one of the ones that survived and he swears that it was because he, he had the ring the, the priest the Atlantis yes. ring on and then it was like in the 60s or something some guy um, started doing experiments into like sacred geometry and seeing how sacred geometry affects um, the, the kind of uh, surroundings of a thing and like does is the shape of something important and he wrote a book in French about um, about all of that Anyway, so I thought, cool, I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna buy a replica and I'm gonna Before test. Before you go to Egypt. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'm like, I'm gonna go in there now. I'll be calling a thing, be like, don't worry, guys. I've got this. <laughs> I'm one of the gang. Okay, I'm part of the priesthood. I'm good. And um, but it's it's a really cool ring. And people are like, oh, that's a cool ring. I'm like, yeah, did you know it's an exact replica of a second dynasty priest? They're like, okay, he's weird. <laughs> She's weird. Um but but I have to admit, and I went in like completely like cool because apparently it has uh like property like it's good for your health and it changes it's good energy and it takes away bad energy it's good luck and all that stuff and so i tried it i was like hey i'll wear it for a month and see if there's any difference and i also bought one for a friend um so we could both see our opinions and both of us had really similar things i have the kind of self-diagnosed adhd like i find it so hard to focus on stuff my mind goes like especially when i'm exercising or trying to focus on one task i will find my mind will like flip out and go and i'll be like oh i need to do the washing but oh no i need to walk the dog now and not yeah it takes me forever to (laughs) film a video it takes a long time but i found and i didn't this wasn't something that i pre-thought about it's just something i observed after my focus is mentally good when i am wearing this ring and i can like work out for 45 minutes straight without being distracted on something else um i feel calmer it's weird and i'm like That's maybe cool. it's a maybe it's it's one of those um what's it called effects where you're placebo, um, placebo, placebo. Effect? maybe yeah. it's a placebo but it's weird because it wasn't something i was expecting to happen i didn't think that hyper focus was was one of the good things about the ring but um same with my friend i was like do you notice anything about the ring that i bought you for your birthday and she was like oh my god i sat and i did like paperwork like office work, and i can't do that and she was like i sat for like three hours and i just did it i was and i was like wow and she 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 likes it as well so maybe it's a load of woo woo but i love the fact that it's uh an old time and but also this design um it's nothing like that turns up in egypt designs like it's so um kind of square and mechanical and yeah. again it's early early dynasty and so mm. the legend is is that this priest because the apparently the priests were the ones that hold on to all the sacred information from before and the, yeah egypt's history atlantis and whatnot so they call it the kind of the atlantis ring because it was kept held on to by an early early priest who was trying to preserve the the knowledge and now i've got it so great where do you get one of these yeah rings? i'm like uh, i need to get one <laughs> we need so to put i found this on uh, you can get them you can get them on like etsy and amazon you can get very cheap replicas um but there's a lady who makes it i think she's called atlantisring.net and she hand makes them and she she does it with a cad machine so she gets the geometry because she's like it's all about the geometry being like bang on and um to get the to get the better benefits of it and um you can see people write reviews and people buy them and say like oh my god this is amazing or um and you can you, you can get them in um different 
because she said what what it's made of doesn't matter. Like the original one was made of stone as one hmm. stone. Um, and she doesn't make them out of stone, but she, you can choose, you can have them like you can have brass or silver and or, this one's gold because I'm bougie, but um, <laughs> you can, <laughs> but you can, um, it's very, you could get one for like $30 and, and it's not the, what it's made of. It's the shape of it. That's important. So, All right, that's um, cool. yeah, no, cool. definitely like check it. that out. Check it out, folks. Yeah. The super secret <laughs> special magical ring. <laughs> From Atlanta. Super secret From Atlantis. special <laughs> magic ring. <laughs> and the builders of the ancient mysteries. Uh, make sure you, uh, we'll, we'll put links in the show notes, but make sure you go see the newer version that Johanna. Yeah, the new version, not the old version, because yeah. the old version's not me. Yeah, the old version. Yes, we did watch the version currently on Amazon, right? Right. Yes, is uh, the old version. Yeah, so, so hopefully they'll go to the change website. that. Swap, they'll swap that out soon. But I'll, yeah, I'll put links in the show notes to go get the uh, the new version with Johanna. All right, Johanna, right. that was great. Tell people where they can Thank get a hold you. of you and go see your work. Um, I'm on the internet. Um, I am at Funny Old World, like ye old with an E. Um, that's my, kind of my handle on like Facebook and YouTube and Instagram. There All we right. go. Um, yeah, you can find me. Do you have a website or just just the socials? I don't actually. I don't. Um, I have. Well, funnyoldworld.com is my merch site. There we are. Okay. Um, uh, because you got I links decided... to the ring. <laughs> <laughs> you get the ring. Um, no, you... <laughs> I decided to do some fun merch because I, I I'm a comedian. My background was like acting, acting comedian, and um, I did five years on the internet doing comedy sketches before I did ancient history stuff. So now I'm sort of transitioning. So you can still probably find the odd weird video of me dressed up in some sort of character. But um, yes, yeah, so I thought if I'm gonna do merch, let's do comedy merch. So I do the Copper Chisels Band, which is um, fantastic. Yes. If you want to join my rock band and you can get band merch. So my merch is like merch with the band, really. But yeah. Okay. That's great. That is good. All right. We'll put links to everything in the show notes. Thank you so much for coming on, John. Thanks, it's been guys. A, it's been a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Yeah. This is so fun. I'm so tired now. It's my bedtime. <laughs> it I'm going to go and yeah. sleep this off. But thank you. That's amazing. You've been, you informed me. Thank you. Yeah, you informed us as well. Thank you. And I hope you guys enjoyed that. We certainly did. Uh, Johanna is hilarious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. She cracks, cracks us up for sure. And uh, I'm really glad that she's involved in this project. Oh, man, the opportunity to go to uh, Barbar Bar Caves. Bar Caves. Uh, can't pass that up. She better do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or we'll be mad. We will be very <laughs> mad. So, uh, you guys can get a hold of us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. I do read all the emails. I can't possibly read them on the show, and I haven't been reading any on the show recently, so we are going to be doing a listener communications episode here very soon to catch up. Uh, so look for that coming up soon. And uh, check out the website, brothersoftheserpent.com. That's where all the podcast related stuff is, including Snake Skins, which is our merchandise store. Get your t shirts, get uh, hats. Uh, Get cell phone cases, coffee mugs. A pillow for camping at the Bar Bar Caves. Yes, <laughs> you may need a pillow if you're going to the Bar Bar Caves. Uh, you can also find links there to uh, donate to the show. Uh, join the Pyramid Scheme through Patreon or PayPal. If you're on Patreon, you get Patreon content. And we do actually have a Patreon episode that we still need to work on so that we can, re we can release it. Oh, I've completely forgotten about this. <laughs> yes, we need to do that. <laughs> I do need to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, join the Patreon, and uh, sometimes we'll get you Patreon episodes when Kyle remembers to do it. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, join the Discord. That's the other place where you can interact with other Snake Force members. You can see a link to that on the website as well. Thanks to Jeff and all the admins who manage that place. It is being revamped right now. Things are changing because the Discord is growing. Uh, so be patient with us and the admins while they do that. And be nice in the chats, guys, always. Yep. And, uh, yeah, thanks to, again, Ben from Uncharted X. Uh, he's been so, it's been so great to get to know Ben. And, yeah, thanks to Johanna for coming on the show. And thanks to all of you guys out there that listen. We love you. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Go on, get. <laughs> <laughs>